seated. We'll start with uh, a welcome address by Professor Dr. Katuria, who is the director and CEO of ITRIA. So, Dr. Katuria, please. Wait a couple of seconds for everybody to settle down. <clears throat> okay, well, good morning, everybody. A very warm welcome to, to all of you to this consultative workshop on tackling chronic diseases in India. Uh, and I know a lot of you have come from travel long distance uh, to be here with us and Thank you very much and a very warm welcome uh, to all of you. This is the second uh, workshop on the subject uh, within the broader ambit of our health policy initiative. Uh, for those who may not be aware, this multi-phased initiative was to analyze institutional problems <coughs> plaguing India's healthcare sector and to develop actionable policy recommendations to address these. For those who are not aware of what ICRIA does, uh, ICRIA been around in the policy space for about more than 30 years now, since 1981, and our core mission is to develop actionable policy recommendations, whether the government agrees with them or not, uh, that's not what we do. We don't do really advocacy, but uh, at least we develop policy recommendations based on you know, workshops such as these to get inputs from experts within the sector, so to make really policy more evidence-based. So that's our core mission. Uh, and I'm happy to note that, you know, in this initiative, health policy initiative, which is a crying need in India to develop some sort of reforms, we are holding this workshop. And the purpose uh, of the earlier workshops uh, under this initiative was to identify what are the core areas, and we uh, drill down on two, which is uh, drug regulatory reforms and the topic of this workshop, which is uh, chronic diseases. And we are now ending or nearing the completion of year one of research on drug regulatory reforms. And next Friday, exactly a week from today, we will have a, a workshop that will discuss the first draft of the papers. This workshop marks the completion of quarter one of our chronic care research program. We have done desk research. And even if we, as we start this workshop, we are about to embark upon <laughs> primary research, and we will travel within India. As you know, India is a country which is as big as a continent, so we will with travel within India, and there's enough diversity within the country. And uh, Ali and his team have chosen Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Rajasthan, and Uttar Pradesh. And then we will do international comparisons. We've chosen four countries, Sri Lanka, Japan, US, and Canada, and all these uh, field visits will be conducted between May and August. Given the distinguished panelists that we have with us today, we'd like to treat this workshop as well as kind of trying to pick your brains, asking the right questions, and asking you uh, what are the right questions we should ask when, when we should ask when we embark upon our primary survey. The person who will be taking all your questions, we've given you a, a pad and a, 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 and a pencil to, to note your questions. And one of our research associates uh, who's here, Siddharth, where are you? Sid? <coughs> yes, Sid will be collecting from you uh, your questions. And we hope to have a discussion on those questions in the post lunch session uh, of this workshop. You know, all of you, just to mention a very famous quote by Jeffrey Rose, an eminent epidemiologist who ardently argued for preventive strategies to health improvement. And, uh, you know, medical thinking, according to him, had been largely concerned with responding to needs of sick individuals. And his thinking now uh, is quite pervasive and has been extended into risk identification and disease prevention. And that's what we are hoping uh, that we will also do in this uh, uh, workshop and in this research project. Given not just the cost of health effectiveness of the preventive approach, our effort under this research project is to best see how we can identify the risk factors associated with chronic diseases, as well as develop, as I said, actionable policy recommendations towards developing a primary health system which is oriented to the primary prevention of risk factors 
and chronic conditions. So with these words, uh, uh, which would give you some idea of the kind of work that we are doing. So essentially, there are two parts of our health policy initiative. One is the chronic care disease, chronic diseases, which we are uh, going to discuss today. And then there is drug regulatory reforms, which we will, uh, which we've discussed, and we will hold additional workshops in that area as well later. But with these words, let me say it's absolutely a delight to welcome uh, Professor David Bloom, uh, who needs, I think, needs no introduction. Uh, let me also mention on the side that we've been working with the World Bank on a project on jobs, and there are a few names that keep coming up as reference points to the literature on jobs and labor regulations that we constantly are uh, identified or constantly are reminded that we should identify with. And that name, one of the names, is Professor David Bloom's name. And he's done a lot of work in labor regulation. I'm delighted to have him here for this health uh, policy workshop, and he's the Clarence James Gamble Professor of Economics and Demography in the Department of Global Health and Population at Harvard School of Public Health. He's an internationally acclaimed economist <coughs> from whose work we have learned about the intersections of health, demography, education, and labor. He's written extensively on primary, secondary, and tertiary education in developing countries and the links among health status, population dynamics, and economic growth. He's published over 300 articles, books, chapters, and he also serves as the director of Harvard's program on global demography of aging. So clearly, a formidable CV, a distinguished career, and Ikra is absolutely delighted to have David Bloom uh, with us today. Thank you, Professor. Um, thank you, Rajat, and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm also very pleased to be here. Uh, one reason I'm pleased to be here is because it means I'm not in Boston. Um, as, as some of you may know, Boston has taken the most unbelievable pounding with snow and cold weather this winter, the worst in its history. Um, uh, so as I say, I'm happy to be here, although when I look at the weather forecast for Delhi, I think maybe I let the pendulum swing a little too far. Um, so I'm, the jury's still out on that. Um, the, the, the main reason, in fact, that I'm happy to be here um, uh, is because I think the workshop um, that uh, Rajat just described and that we're going to have today is addressing one of the most consequential challenges that India faces on its, uh, on its horizon, uh, namely the challenge of, uh, of chronic diseases. Um, and I very much appreciate the opportunity to participate in the discussion and to think together uh, about the kinds of evidence um, and the kinds of um, actionable solutions um, that uh, India should be directing itself towards. Um, I've been asked to give a few opening uh, comments uh, about the cha that challenge and also about today's workshop. Uh, and I thought that what I might do is just share a very simple framework that I use when I think about problems in global health. Um, it's a three-part framework. Um, it's what I call the what, uh, the so what, and the now what. Uh, the what refers to the issues um, that we're trying to address. Uh, the so what refers to why they matter, why they're important. And then now what refers to what, what we should do about them. And that's how uh, I approach many, many problems in global health. And I thought what I might do is just offer a few initial comments about each of those <clears throat> components to help uh, inform or stimulate some of the, uh, the thinking um, uh, for, the, for, the, for the next few hours. Um, so obviously, the what is about um, chronic disease. Um, uh, so we're talking here about um, cardiovascular disease, chronic ob obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, cancer, diabetes, mental health conditions, uh, musculoskeletal problems, sensory um, uh, health issues, uh, et cetera. Um, and I have to say, um, just right out of the starting gate, that um, I applaud the authors of um, today's report um, for resisting the temptation to refer to them as non-communicable diseases. Um, uh, that is um, uh, a very unfortunate misnomer um, that I think the U.S., uh, or rather the U.N. has um, pushed on us. Um, and it's a misnomer because um, so many of these conditions actually have communicable origins, whether we're talking about um, sort of hepatitis leading to uh, liver cancer or human papillomavirus and cervical cancer. Um, uh, so, uh, so I think that's important. And I think it actually is a misnomer for another reason, which is maybe a slightly deeper point, but one that I, I think will be relevant to our discussions today. And that has to do not with the, the biological uh, communicability, but the social communicability of many of the risk factors for the chronic conditions we're talking about. So um, talking about here things like uh, consumption of um, highly caloric, 
sugar and fat-laden diets. Uh, I'm speaking about physical inactivity, uh, use of um, tobacco, uh, harmful use of alcohol. Um, there's a great deal of um, kind of um, behavioral uh, and, and social epidemiology that goes um, with these behaviors that I think is going to be driving um, the, uh, the chronic disease epidemic that uh, India will be facing in the future. Um, here I would also um, take note at the outset of um, the fact that not only are there what we call modifiable risk factors, um, which is the diet, physical activity, alcohol, tobacco being the main ones we normally think about, but there are also um, non-modifiable risk factors for uh, chronic diseases. And uh, typically here we speak about um, genetics, um, although that I think is actually uh, in the light of uh, advances in personalized medicine, I think that may actually become a modifiable risk factor <coughs> in the years to come. And I think India will, uh, is poised to be a, a great leader uh, and innovator in that, in that realm. Um, and then we have another non-modifiable risk factor that I think is tougher to deal with. That's um, age and aging. Um, so uh, population aging, uh, I think as we all understand, um, absolutely adheres to what um, I like to call the iron law of demography. Um, you all know that law because it tells us that every time a year goes by, our age goes up by one. Um, and there's just no escaping that. Um, uh, and, you know, right now um, uh, about 9% of India's population is age 60 and over, which is the, the conventional uh, definition that demographers use for old. Uh, apologies um, uh, to many of you in the room. Um, uh, but that that that's going to change quite dramatically in the coming decades. So in the next three to four decades, that 9% is going to more than double and, and about reach 20% of the population um, age 60 and over. And that's going to create a strong impulse for an increased burden of chronic disease because age really is, um, uh, like it or not, uh, a risk factor. Um, and I would also say that what's interesting about the, the, the point is it also defines the time frame we have to operate in. Um, and because uh, we, we, there, are, there are some decades, there actually is time um, uh, to think about the kinds of policies and programs and initiatives and changes in behavior that can forestall and, and make the challenge, to basically tackle the challenge, I think, which is the title of the report, um, and also um, identify opportunities that exist therein and try to take advantage uh, of them because I don't think it's all, uh, it's all bad news. Now, um, in discussing um, chronic disease, I think we also need to keep in mind uh, another um, iron law. This one is the iron law of epidemiology. Um, and that basically says that we all die once. Um, and that the interesting questions are not whether we die, but rather when we die, from what cause, and under what circumstances. Um, and I think that um, we need to, we need to keep in mind here also that um, that's changed a lot over the years. Um, and the fact that we're here having this conversation about chronic disease in some sense is a great cause for celebration um, because it means that um, we're not dying as we have historically of uh, malnutrition and infectious disease to nearly the same extent. Um, so the, the challenge um, before I think that ICRIA has identified for itself and I think that we all have um, really is to figure out how to turn that success which I would characterize as one of the greatest successes in all human history, the fact that we're living so much longer. Um, throughout most of history people live to 25 or 30 um, on average and now I'm in India I think life expectancy is on the order of um, 68. That is a, a, a phenomenal uh, human achievement and a lot of it's taken place just in the last 50 to 60 years alone. Um, so we have to turn, figure out how to turn that success into victory. I, I feel that's a, uh, maybe a way to frame the issue. And I think that the, the report that we're going to be discussing today is very much in that spirit, um, which is, um, you know, why it resonates uh, so loudly with me. Okay, let me turn to the, the next issue, the so, the so what question, okay? And uh, when we talk about chronic disease and we say, well, so what, why is it important? Um, I, you know, I think obviously the answer to um, medical and population health specialists is very apparent. Uh, it, it has to do with um, premature death and disability um, related, for example, to the fact that 60% of all deaths in India are associated with these um, chronic diseases, okay? A somewhat less obvious point and one that I personally have been interested in pursuing with colleagues in recent years has to do with um, the corresponding economic burden of, of chronic diseases. Um, and that's a burden that's connected to the high cost of uh, treatment and care 
um, for many chronic diseases, and that um, the high cost of treatment and care basically forces us to have to divert resources from other uses, uh, which is unfortunate, um, and especially because in many cases it's resources that we could have used to invest in physical capital, in infrastructure, in research and development, and technological progress, uh, in human capital uh, as well, and economic growth and improvements in, uh, in living standards. Um, it's also uh, a burden that's connected to, uh, and I would say maybe even more considerably, the loss of output um, that goes with chronic disease, morbidity, and mortality. Um, some of the loss of output comes from the fact that there's um, labor force participation rates go down when people um, are sick or dead, obviously. Um, uh, people work fewer hours, and they work less productively, um, typically. Um, now, it's, it's difficult to measure, just I, I, speaking as an economist for a moment, it's, it is quite difficult to measure the economic burden of chronic diseases. We have different approaches. There's a cost of illness approach. There's a value of statistical life approach. There's macro modeling approaches. None of these are perfect. Uh, they all have different properties. They all have different problems. They all have different data requirements that are actually not well suited with the data that typically are available. Um, but n notwithstanding all of those problems, um, the fact is that when people have done um, kind of rough calculations at least, it shows that the economic burden of chronic disease is, is, uh, is not insubstantial. Um, it, it's quite, uh, quite sizable. So um, uh, a number of colleagues and I have been uh, working with a macroeconomic model that the WHO has developed uh, called EPIC. And um, based on our work with that model, um, we calculated that over the 2012 to 2030 period, the economic burden of cardiovascular disease, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, diabetes, cancer, and mental health conditions in India uh, will amount to $4.3 trillion at current exchange rates. Um, so that's, that's more than double um, uh, GDP in India uh, currently. And I think if we took that as a yardstick, we have to say we, this, is some, this is not a trivial sum. We have to pay uh, serious attention to this. Um, now, I, I think an, uh, a good reason to pay serious attention to the economic implications is because that's a very potent way to get the attention of economic policymakers, of people who have the power of the purse, um, who decide on budgets. Uh, for the health sector or the education sector, and, and we're going to, I'm sure, discuss today how the chronic disease challenges that India faces cut across so many different um, sectors. Um, and I think um, uh, the, the, the Minister of Finance and the Minister of um, uh, Ministers of Planning and Economic Advisors to the Prime Minister, et cetera, I mean, that's what they're accountable for. They're accountable for economic growth and poverty reduction. Um, and traditionally, they have viewed investments in, or spending on health as a burdensome cost, not as an investment that yields returns. But the modern view is that health is actually a major form of human capital, very similar to um, education in terms of the fact that we spend the money today in the hopes that people will be more productive and will earn returns in the future and can calculate returns on investment um, in that way. And um, I, I think now the, the, the modern view is th this notion that healthier means wealthier. In other words, that the health of the population is a driver of um, economic growth. And I think um, people increasingly see um, health spending is much more of a necessity than a luxury that uh, countries can afford after they get rich. It's something that actually helps countries to get rich um, along the way. So um, I think that angle is important because it allows us to provide a customized message to certain people. I, obviously, first and foremost, we want to invest in health because um, you know, ethically and morally, it's a good thing to do, it's the right thing to do, it's a fair and just thing to do, or we want to invest in it because of the, uh, the social and political stability that um, healthy populations um, bring us. But I think it's useful to have this other argument to appeal to um, the economic uh, decision makers uh, in, in, uh, in the country. Um, all right, let me, let me turn now and just um, make a few final comments uh, about the, the now what. Um, uh, because, so I, I started working in global health, um, I don't know, 15 years ago or so, um, and in the early days of global health, you could make a name for yourself just by finding things out, just by telling people facts that they didn't know. It was very simple. Um, there was just so much low-hanging fruit. Um, it, was, it was really quite remarkable. But after about, I don't know, three, four, five years, 
you know, people would ask you what you do. You say, well, I, you know, I work on global health, and it's, you know, there are all these disparities and deficits and whatever. And people, I noticed, they would start to kind of glaze over. They say, okay, we, we get that, but so what? Why is it important? And then people around the world started working on the so what question, and there were groups that worked on the social implications and the political and the ethical and the human rights or the international law implications. Some of us worked on the economic uh, implications as well. And then sure enough, another three, four years go by, and people say, you know, what do you do? I work on global health. It's not what it should be or could be, and it really matters a lot from all these points of view. You know, again, glazed over, you know, like, so what? You know, like, what do we do about it, right? You know, how do we fix this problem? That's the, you know, the, the Bill Gates, the Bill Clinton um, uh, perspective, I think, at this point. And I think that's, that's where um, I feel ICRI is starting out, um, you know, in, in its work on chronic disease. I think that's a great place to start because that's where the field of global health quite generally, but I think work on chronic disease is going to live for the next, you know, 10 to 15 years. These are very, very tough problems. The uh, issues of um, management, administration, implementation, intervention, leadership, scaling up, these are the really, really tough issues, and I feel like we need to think very hard and deeply about um, these issues if, uh, if we're going to make, uh, make some progress. So let me just offer a few quick um, <clears throat> uh, observations here. Number one, um, my sense is that the challenge of addressing chronic disease is really quite formidable, um, just based on everything I've been reading and thinking and, and people, you know, observing people I've spoken with. Um, but while I think it's formidable, I don't think it's insurmountable. Um, I think that um, India has options. It has actually a lot of options. And I